Hi, welcome back to McClutchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClutchy and today I'm going to be taking you through our last video in our networks series for Year 12 General Maths on bipartite graphs and the Hungarian algorithm. Thank you so much for staying with me all through this series and a big shout out to Ms Brummel and her class at Sunshine Beach High. Thanks so much for your wonderful feedback. Well, you may recall from one of our earlier videos that we mentioned something called bipartite graphs. It was probably the first video in the whole series. Well, a bipartite graph is one where the two sets of vertices are completely separate from one another. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we've got a picture here of a bipartite graph. We've got two sets, set U and set V, and they're made up of the vertices in each set. Now, you'll notice in set U that none of the vertices are actually joined to one another. They're all joined to vertices in set V, and the same goes in set V. They are not joined to any other vertex in V, only to U. So there's only that crisscross across the two sets. Another feature about bipartite graphs is they can be connected graphs where every vertex in U would connect to every vertex in V. But that doesn't always have to be the case. And if you do remember, a true definition of a connected graph is that every vertex would be connected to every other vertex. So that would be like a semi-connected graph. All tree diagrams are considered to be bipartite. So here's an example of a tree. You remember this from one of our early videos when we looked at minimum spanning trees. And over here, we can turn that into a bipartite graph. Notice that four branches out to one, two, three, and five, and six branches out to five. But nothing goes between four and six, and nothing goes between one, two, three, five. So those two sets are completely distinct and separate from one another. We can also show bipartite graphs as directives. For example, here, we've got a diagram of some warehouses delivering to some shops. Warehouses aren't delivering to one another and shops aren't doing any deliveries and that's why they are two completely separate groups. They can also be weighted and that we've looked at weightings in previous videos and weightings are usually represented as numbers. They could represent costs to deliver from one store to another or the kilometres between the store and the warehouse or it could represent the time taken to make those deliveries to each of the shops. Now we use bipartite graphs to solve what's called allocation problems, where we're trying to work out the best way to use our network to make, for example, deliveries in the most cost or time effective way. So we may not want to use warehouse A to deliver to every shop, that might not be the best way to use our warehouse and our distribution networks. So we need to examine our network and have a look at the most efficient and cost effective way to do that. So in this example that we've talked about before, warehouse A obviously is perhaps that's 10 kilometres to shop one and it's also delivering um, to no other stores. So we've got warehouse B, it's only delivering to shop two. Warehouse C is going to all three, but obviously the distance to shop two being 15 kilometres and shop one 13 kilometres, probably not the best use of the network when warehouse A and B are closer. Now to solve allocation problems, we're I'm going to take you through a quick worked example here. This is a fairly simple one. So what we do is we convert our weighted bipartite graph into a matrix. Now the textbooks that I've been looking at, they haven't done this, they usually provide the matrix for you. And the reason for that is that the more variables that you have in your bipartite graph, the more complicated it gets to read. For example, this one here, I've got every warehouse delivering to every shop. So it starts to get quite complicated when we get situations like this. So most of the time you're going to be given the matrix to start with. But let's have a look at how we get that matrix. So firstly, I'm going to draw up a, um, a matrix. So I've got to have my shops across the top, my warehouses along the side. Now you've done matrices, matrices in grade 11 and typically we put the from on the left hand side and the two up the top but realistically speaking it doesn't matter which way you've put it. Now from shop A, sorry from warehouse A to shop, shop one, two and three we've got the three different distances there so you can follow that across the network there on the left hand side. To B we've got our distances there and to C we've got 11, 8 and 15 are the three distances to the different shops. So now we've represented that information in a matrix and after we do that we don't really need our network bipartite graph anymore. We can just focus on our matrix. Now what we want to do is try and work out which warehouse should be delivering to which store. Now you could probably just do this by inspection because it's a fairly easy solution. If you just look at it you can see that um, 
warehouse B should be delivering to store three, warehouse C to store two, and warehouse A to store one. Because that's the smallest number in each one, it makes a logical sense just by inspection. And that's quite a valid way to identify which is the most appropriate allocation. However, we are going to look at some more complex ones. So let's just do this with a simple one first. So if we do what's called row reduction on the matrix, which means we find the smallest number in each row. So the smallest number, for example, in that first row is going to be the number 10. And we subtract 10 from all the numbers in that row only. So firstly, what I'm going to do is show that what it looks like here. I've taken 10 away from 10, gives me 0, 13, take away 10 gives me 3, 22 take away 10 gives me 12. They're, they're shown to you in red. Then I'm going to do the second, the same thing on the next row, reduce row B. Now I find the smallest number again in row B, take it away from every number in row B. So 26 take away 3 is 3, 23 and so on. Do the same in row C. Smallest number there is 8 and I take that away from every number in that row. So now we've got this matrix on the right hand side where we've got a zero in each row. That's fantastic because now what we're going to do is cross out the zeros. We're going to do this either vertically or horizontally. So we're going to put straight lines through the zeros. And here we go, just like that. We've done that through the rows. And the zeros tell us who is the best store to be receiving their warehouse from. Or sorry, the best warehouse to receive from the store. Okay, very important. Do not cross out with diagonal lines. That's a big no-no. It's just vertical, just horizontal. An alternative way we could have done it would have been with vertical lines. There's no right or wrong answer here as long as we are crossing out the zeros. Okay, so I think you get the idea. That was a pretty easy question. So now I'm just going to redraw that for you as a weighted bipartite graph using my original numbers where all the zeros are going to connect the warehouses to a single shop. Now, you don't necessarily have to redraw it as a bipartite graph if the question doesn't ask you to do it. But sometimes it makes a nice picture tells a thousand words, as they say. It looks really obvious now which warehouse should be delivering to which shop. So only do that. Take the time to do that if you're asked to. If you're not, save yourself some time and don't do it. Just read your matrix. Your matrix tells you where you see zeros. That means the connection you, you basically take across the row, down the column. That tells you which warehouse will deliver to which shop. So what you should do though is finish with a statement. So warehouse A should deliver to shop one, warehouse B to shop three, warehouse C to shop two. Now if you remember back several slides back when we looked at the question it did ask us what would be the minimum total distance that we would be traveling and obviously if you're going to be traveling in a network you want to keep those distances down as much as possible because they represent real costs, wear and tear on cars, petrol etc. So we want to make sure we've got the minimum total distance. So we're going to add the distances that each um, delivery is going to take. And 10 plus 3 plus 8 gives us 21 kilometres. So once again, use your units of measurement in your final answer. Well, I think that one was a pretty easy question. Why don't we do something a little bit more complicated? And I'm going to introduce you to the Hungarian algorithm. So in this particular case, we've now got a 4 by 4 matrix. We've got a small business. The boss wants to allocate four tasks to four employees such that each employee ends up with just one task. We need to work out what's the optimum allocation. So in other words, who should get which task and state the total time to complete all four tasks. Okay, so the first thing, we don't need to draw a bipartite graph. We're not asked to do that and that's not going to help us to use the Hungarian algorithm. So our first thing we're going to do is perform that row reduction that we did in example one. So looking at our first row, our smallest number is the number 67. We're going to take that away from each of the numbers in our first row. And that's shown on the right hand side in red. We're going to do the same for Mary. We're going to look across and take 35 away from each of the numbers in row two. Take three from each of the numbers in row three and take six from each of the numbers in row, row four. So now we've got this row reduced matrix on the right hand side. This is what we're going to use to inspect to see if we can find a solution. We're going to cover our zeros with the smallest number of horizontal and or vertical lines. Now you might think, well, why wouldn't I just draw a line through each row? Because each row's now got a zero in it. But there is an, a smaller number of lines that we can pass through our network. Let me show you. I can pass a vertical line this way, a vertical line this way, and a vertical line this way, three lines. 
Now, this is a problem. I need to have the number of lines equaling the number of tasks to get the optimum allocation. And like I said before, you might be thinking, well, why wouldn't I have just drawn a line through each row and just gone with that? Well, there may be a better solution where we're going to be allocating our tasks more effectively. So we're going to be applying what's called the Hungarian algorithm now, because we could have passed through those with, let's have a look again, whoop, three lines. So notice in task three, there's two zeros in that column. So that is the best number. It's got the smallest number of lines. Okay, so now I'm going to do what's called performing column reduction. It's the same thing as performing row reduction, which we did along the bottom. We're now going to do it up and down. So we look again at columns one to three for the smallest number, and the smallest number is already zero. So we don't need to perform column reduction on those particular columns. But in column four, our smallest number is 15. So we're going to reduce everything in column 15 by 15. And now we've got a zero in column four. Now, we're not finished just yet. We've got to do something else as part of the Hungarian algorithm. We're now going to cover our zeros with the smallest number of lines. You notice I've got one, two, three. Okay, so you need to inspect this very carefully. So this is going to be a problem because I've still only got three and I need to have four lines. The minimum number needs to be four. So like I said earlier, no diagonal lines. You can see three zeros running through the diagonal. That's a big no-no. Okay, and always double check to make sure that there's not a smaller number of lines that you could have done to do this, otherwise you'll end up with the wrong allocation. Okay, now what we're gonna do is make sure we're going to do the next step of the Hungarian algorithm, which is we look for the smallest number that's not covered. And you can see that there, it's number six. So we're gonna take six away from all our uncovered numbers and then add it to any numbers that have been double crossed. Now that sounds like a bit of a mouthful. Let's have a look and see how that's gonna work. So I've shown you in red all of the numbers that were not covered. I've taken six away from each of those. And then we've got our double cross numbers, which are down the bottom, one and 90. So what I'm gonna do is add it to those numbers. So now I've added six to both of those. Now, some textbooks, from that stage, do some slightly different things. I know Nelson Q Maths does something different. This example is taken from a Jacarena textbook. But one thing you need to be aware of is that both methods end up in the exact same place. So if you really like my method where you're just taking it away again, so that's mostly about subtraction and all you've got to worry about is adding it to those two ones at the bottom that are double crossed, that's a fairly quick, easy method. Okay, so now we're going to cover all those zeros again with the least number of lines. So I've got these two vertical zeros there. I've got another one there. I've got another one there. And I've got another one there. Or I could have gone along the bottom. It wouldn't really matter because I'm still going to have four lines. So now we've got an optimum allocation. So I'm going to use my original matrix to determine the, the times. And I'm going to redraw that by pi type graph. That can help. Some people are a bit more visual, but you, like I said, you don't need to do it unless you're asked to do it, because as you can see, it's a bit of work to create the bipartite graph. So here's our original matrix now, and on the right-hand side is the graph, and that shows you very clearly that there's a couple of tasks that only one person can do. Ella is the only person who should be doing task four, and Mary is the only person who should be doing task two. However, we've got Sam and Ella could do task one, and Fred and Sam could do task three. So we need to have a think about this. Ella's already allocated to task four, so we can't give her task one as well, well because our um, constraints at the beginning of the example was that one person each had to have a different task. So it's very obvious that if Ella's gonna get task four, then task number one has to go to Sam. So that's Sam and Ella taking care of and Mary on task two, which leaves just Fred with task three. So this is what we do now. We use that information, we write a statement, and I've simplified that bipartite graph to show who's going to be doing what. Now the total times for all those tasks to be completed is 132 minutes or two hours and 12 minutes. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, why wouldn't they all just work at the same time? Why would I have to add them together? But you might need to consider that these could be steps in a process where Fred does, oh, sorry, where Sam does the first step 
And then when she's finished, Mary does the next step and then Fred does the next step and then Ella does the next step. And so it might be something like an assembly line where they just sit there all day and just keep doing the same thing over and over again. So the shortest, if this was making, for example, a mobile phone and the four people are doing their steps, the earliest you can get that finished is two hours and 12 minutes. Alternatively, you could approach it in a different way. Let's say they were doing four tasks all day long and those four employees all started their individual task at the same time, they would all be done in 67 minutes or an hour and seven minutes. Now, most of these applications of Hungarian algorithms are gonna be more along the lines of what I just talked about in terms of an assembly line where one person starts, the next one goes, the next one goes, the next one goes. So, um, there are situations though where you could apply the allocation problem to four people doing the same thing at the same time. And then you might ask yourself, well, why not just get Ella to do task one and then task two. And then that would only take her 13 minutes and then Sam could be doing task three and Fred could just go and be reallocated somewhere in the business. Because, well, you could just give him task four because that's all that's left over, but that would take 90 minutes and that's a worse outcome than what we found earlier with the Hungarian algorithm. So the Hungarian algorithm wins. Okay, and you might also think, Fred, you're too slow. We're gonna basically sack you. We'll get Sam one to do task one and task four and that would take Sam 99 minutes. So once again, Hungarian algorithm wins. So you might also be thinking, well, let's get Ella. She's pretty fast. She can do task one, two, and then four, and we still get rid of Fred. That could be a better solution because now the three tasks can be done in just a matter of 34 minutes. That could be an interesting way of approaching it. Well, it's a logical scenario and it does offer a better solution than the Hungarian algorithm in this case, but life isn't always that simple. Because remember, our constraints of our task said that each person must do one task only. So that kind of tends to imply that it's probably an assembly line situation. And life isn't always as simple as just sacking somebody. There's always implications to sacking people. And Fred may have other qualities, not just about being speedy. So it's not all about how fast you are. Sometimes it might also be that Fred's very good at attention to detail. Okay, well, that's all we have time for. I hope you've enjoyed this video series. I'll be producing some new videos over the coming weeks for units one, two, and three for general maths. So stay tuned for that if you're a teacher. And if you're a student, all the best with your revision. Do feel free to look back at some of our previous videos to revise for your external exams. Have a lovely day.